after Zhou Jingwen, and I had the pleasure to, to be his uh, uh, master thesis advisor. He, and even before that, he came to my laboratory uh, at undergraduate years. And after he got master degree, he was offered fellowship by uh, Caltech and, and worked under uh, Professor Kimball. And in 2007, he uh, joined uh, NIST and uh, did a uh, very great contribution. And perhaps you all know that a few years ago, uh, his experiment demonstrated that uh, a very precise atomic clock that reached a resolution of precision of 10 to the mi minus 18. And that kind of resolution, you can even just lift the clock 30 centimeters up, you will see the clock slow down. Okay. So that was a big news at that time. And now he is uh, uh, continuing his career in, in NIST. And what I had uh, the, the best impression of uh, Dou Jingwen is in, in my laboratory, we were working on mainly high power laser instead of quantum uh, optics or, and that, that kind of direction. But he did uh, this uh, exploration almost on his own. And uh, eventually he was very, he has achieved a lot in this field. And also I can comment, I can, I can um, tell you the comment about him from my wife. My wife was a, was a theorist, a mathematician. And one time my wife was, was giving a talk it's very difficult mathematical theory. And according to my wife, all the students was falling asleep <laughs> because the, the, the eye, you know, their eye becomes smaller and smaller. And my wife told me, only Zhou Jingwen has a bright eye in that lecture. <laughs> so he's, she told me that this person is not a simple guy because she, he, can, he can do experiment and also understand uh, deep theory. Okay. So let's welcome Zhou Jingwen. Oh, by the way, uh, his, his work also uh, become a, a big contribution for the uh, for Nobel Prize uh, laureate Weinland. Like your Weinland. Weinland. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he was cited uh, several several contribution, and one is uh, actually done by you. Well, uh, thanks for the really really nice introduction, and uh, uh, it's really it feels great to be back and see uh, all the familiar faces. Family uh, people in the department. Although I, I never uh, work in this building, and I feel like I'm back home. And it's a great pleasure for me to uh, uh, talk about under the uh, general theme of uh, quantum logic spectroscopy. And I would introduce to you um, the work I've been doing in uh, this folder, uh, including high accuracy atomic clocks based on aluminum ion and also our recent effort uh, towards uh, precision molecular spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, here's a brief outline of my talk. First I would uh, tell you what is quantum logic spectroscopy and then I would uh, uh, talk about the first application of this uh, protocol that is the optical atomic clock based on the frequency reference of aluminum ion. And uh, I'll give you a progress report uh, on our recent effort for uh, molecular ion quantum logic spectroscopy. Okay, um, uh, first I want to motivate why we want to do a uh, quantum logic spectroscopy. And in the history of physics, uh, precision spectroscopy in atomic molecular and optical physics has been the driving force, one of the driving forces that uh, force us to refine the theories describing the physical world. And with a higher and higher precision, you can look at, you can examine the theories with greater and greater scrutiny, and that led to a refined theory. Just think about uh, when people discovered fine structure, hyperfine structure in the spectra, what happened to the theory. 
And in modern uh, precision spectroscopy, we have generally some uh, desirable features. Uh, say I want to probe a particle, uh, a transition in the particle with a probe laser. If the particle just whipped by the uh, interaction region, you only have limited time for uh, probing the transition. And that would give you limited resolution, limited precision. So a desirable feature would be trap the particle that would lead to long probe time and also since the particle is not going anywhere the average velocity is zero and you have minimal linear Doppler effect okay so trapping is one feature we desire and the other features uh, is that um, although the linear Doppler effect is uh, minimized uh, the particle could be still at finite temperature and we would have higher order Doppler effect. And to reduce that, uh, we would like to use um, cooling laser to cool down the uh, average kinetic energy. And also we would like to have a way to efficiently read out the internal state of this particle. And these two features um, usually requires a cycling transition for laser cooling and also for uh, fluorescence detection. Uh, if you don't know what cycling transition is, it's basically a transition in which uh, you shine a laser and then the population of this particle would keep cycling between the two states. And then we can, the scattered photon would reduce the kinetic energy that's basically laser cooling. And then uh, the scattered photon can also be collect collected by photodetectors and we would know the internal state of this particle. And additionally, we would like to minimize all the known physical factors that would uh, influence the transition frequency. So we want to be able to perform coherent spectroscopy, say uh, Raman spectroscopy, or uh, use uh, all sorts of techniques to prepare, uh, say, entangled state to improve the uh, resolution of the spectroscopy or stability. And in the setting of ion trap, uh, the requirement for uh, trapping and cooling is relatively easily achieved. Um, this is a picture of linear arc pole trap. And say, if you want to study this uh, particle as charged, and it can be automatically, it, it can be trapped in the ion trap. And if we have another uh, atomic ion in the same trap and through the Coulomb inter interaction, their motions are coupled. And to describe their motion, we have to uh, talk in terms of normal modes. And we can use an atomic ion with a nice cycling transition and for detection too, uh, that we can just cool the motion of this uh, atomic ion and because the motions are coupled, both of their motion are going to be cooled. So uh, this is so-called synthetic cooling. And with that, we will be able to trap and cool a charged particle. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the uh, species of the charged particle is. And I know uh, um, ion trap is kind of um, exotic in this audience. So I'll give you a brief introduction of what we'll be using. And this is a general uh, configuration of a linear arc pole trap. It has four rods. And the cross section, you can see that in the transverse uh, direction, we apply the radio frequency voltage onto these two rods and then uh, ground these two electrodes. And uh, they form an oscillating particle field. And because the charged particle doesn't like to be driven around, it would look for the minimal uh, arc field point. And due to this translational symmetry, well, the whole axis would be of minimal uh, arc uh, driving field. And the ions would like to be on the axis. So we have a confinement in the radial direction. To uh, complete the trap, we want to uh, induce axial confinement too. So what we did was 
uh, applying positive voltage in order to trap a positively charged particle. <coughs> and that provides um, trapping potential in the axial direction that gives you uh, axial confinement. And with uh, both of uh, these confinement, then we have the 3D confinement, and it's a trap. And uh, the essence of uh, trap ion quantum information processing is we are using the coupled motion as information bus. And uh, since we can do a really good job in cooling the shared motion of uh, ions in the same trap, uh, we need to talk about quantized uh, harmonic oscillator motion. And when we finish ground state cooling, the um, ions would be in the ground state of motion with zero uh, motional quantum. And uh, the quantum information processing technique we are borrowing is uh, able to excite the motion uh, quantum by quantum depending on the internal state of uh, the ion. So uh, we can transfer the internal state to be uh, uh, motional quantum. And then in turn, we can transfer the motional quantum into the internal state of the uh, atomic ion. And in that sense, we can couple the internal state of two ions in the same trap. OK, uh, this slide will tell you what uh, quantum logic <coughs> spectroscopy, the basic ideas are. Uh, in this protocol, we will have a spectroscopy ion, which has some interesting transitions we like to probe. And uh, most likely it won't have uh, accessible cyclone transition. So to be able to uh, read out the internal state and do laser cooling, we would have another ion we call logic ion that has a nice cyclone transition and good qubit. And qubit is a two-level system. And it's suitable for laser cooling and state readout. Uh, the protocol would proceed like this. Uh, we first pro probe the transition in the spectroscopy ion. Then, in general, we will leave the spectroscopy ion in the superposition state. And using the quantum logic technique, we can transfer the internal state of the logic ion to the motion, the shared motion, this M means motion. If we are in the zero state for the spectroscopy ion, then we don't excite uh, motion, emotional quantum. And if we are in a one state, then we can excite one quantum from, of motion. And further uh, downstream, we can transfer the state of the motion to the logic ion. And the end result is that we are creating an entangled state between the spectroscopy ion and the logic ion. And the final step in the um, protocol is measure the state of the logic ion in the qubit basis, zero or one. And with uh, probability alpha square, we get zero uh, outcome. And probability beta square, we get one outcome. That's basically equivalent to uh, measuring the spectroscopy ion in its uh, qubit state. And with that, we are able to, we will be able to uh, do spectroscopy on the spectroscopy ion without the cyclone transition. And the first application of this quantum logic spectroscopy is uh, construction of the optical atomic clock. Uh, optical, optical atomic clock consists of uh, optical frequency oscillator, a laser oscillator, and also an optical frequency counter, a nanosecond frequency cone. Uh, the frequency of the laser oscillator is referenced to uh, a stable transition in either a single ion or a neutral atom. And by, with the capability of deter, detecting the change in internal state, we would know if the laser frequency is well uh, locked to this transition. And uh, the stability of this transition can be transferred to the frequency of the laser oscillator. So we would have a stable, stable uh, stream of uh, oscillation that, come, that behaves as the clicks ticks of clock. Then we count the steady stream of uh, ticks, and that would allow us to allow us to keep time. And with a oscillator and a counter, 
we have a clock. The frequency reference in our optical clock is uh, aluminum 27 ion. This ion has a nice and narrow clock transition uh, between singlet, singlet S0 and triple P0 state. The natural line width is about 8 millihertz. And uh, the clock transition frequency is quite sensitive to external fields. Right? And what make it uh, special is that this transition frequency has the smallest known room temperature black body radiation shift. Uh, this shift is due to the ubiquitous uh, black body environment that uh, the ion sits in. So if we use a room temperature apparatus, uh, we would have some uh, black body radiation spectrum interacting with the ion. And because it, it is uh, electromagnetic field, it's shifting the energy levels in different ways in general. But uh, these two levels happen to experience the same uh, shift due to electromagnetic field in this uh, black body spectrum. So that's a, a happy coincidence that we have really insen uh, good insensitivity to black body radiation. We can operate our clock at room temperature without worrying about going to cryogenic temperature. And unfortunately, all these nice uh, transition properties has the drawback that uh, the cycling transition in this aluminum 27 ion is at 167 nanometer. And current technology still make it difficult to reach that wavelength. And even, even if we can uh, produce a laser at that wavelength, the uh, line width is still too broad to uh, allow efficient uh, laser cooling. So we used a uh, quantum logic uh, technique to uh, provide us with the capability for cooling, state preparation, and readout. In this example, we, are, uh, we have a beryllium ion in the same trap, and that, that, does the, uh, that plays the role of the logic ion. Okay, I'm uh, skipping a lot of details in terms of building that clock and just show you this uh, uh, systematic table. And if you work with precision measurement, you know this is the majority of effort we spend on. We spend most of our time producing this table. And I mentioned that um, black body radiation is a shift we worry about. And, and uh, trying to make the clock as accurate as possible. We are trying to uh, constrain the uncertainty. Each physical uh, parameter can uh, influence the transition frequency. And because the aluminum ion has relatively low mass, light mass, uh, the motion, motional shift, uh, in particular the micro motion time dilation and secular motion time dilation shift is, uh, needs extra attention. And micro motion is just the motion driven by the oscillating arc field that's doing the confinement for the ion. So it's moving at uh, tens of megahertz, even hundreds of megahertz. And secular motion is the oscillatory motion after you uh, average away the fast uh, micro motion, you will still have the slow uh, oscillatory motion. And there are other factors, but uh, we are able to uh, constrain the uncertainty for those generation of uh, aluminum ion clocks we have finished con constructed. The first uh, generation was using a beryllium ion as the logic ion and reached uh, low 10 to, my, 10 to my 17 in accuracy or frequency uncertainty. And the second generation aluminum ion clock is using a magnesium 25 ion uh, as the logic ion. And we, the reason we went from uh, ber beryllium ion to magnesium ion because the mass match between aluminum 27 and magnesium 25 is, is a lot better, and the cooling, the synthetic cooling works a lot well, uh, a lot better. Yeah. And with the second generation, we were able, we were able to uh, break through the 10 to minus 17 barrier and at the uncertainty slightly below 10 to minus 17. Okay. 
with uh, high accuracy uh, atomic clocks, we have some application in fundamental physics. In the year 2008, we have reported um, uh, frequency ratio measurement between uh, optical clocks based on aluminum ion and mercury ion. And that measurement has 17 significant digits. And why are we interested in measuring some number with so uh, high precision? Because um, we can link the ratio we measure really well to whether the fundamental constant, uh, how, however the fundamental constant affects that ratio uh, through uh, first principle calculations. And in particular, in, in our case, the ratio is directly linked to the change in phi structure constant. So with that link, you know, if you see the ratio, the major ratio change at all, if it changes at all, we can say uh, the phi structure constant actually varies over time. And um, about a, almost a decade ago, we performed the measurement over the course of a year. The uh, result is still consistent with no change, and um, we can't say if the, if the fine structure constant is changing at all. But uh, we are trying to re revive the mercury ion optical clock back to operation, and we are hoping to put another point on this graph and really say whether that uh, that that quantity is zero, positive, or negative. Stay tuned. And with the two uh, aluminum ion uh, clocks at 10 to minus 17 in the accuracy level, we were able to see relativistic effects at uh, scales that if we experience in our daily life. So with that, I think uh, Dr. Wong stole my thunder, but it's okay. It's still lots of uh, fun stuff. And the first uh, real uh, relative relativistic effects we observe with our clocks in our daily life is time dilation. That's uh, well known in uh, twin paradigms. In relativity, uh, there's this well known twin paradox in which a um, pair of, of twins, one of them would go on an uh, interplanet trip. And upon her return, she found that she is a lot younger than her twin. In relativity, you would argue that uh, since the velocity is relative, you can say the other party is the one who is traveling. And they can both argue they, um, they will be younger than the other one. But uh, it's actually the turning around and meeting that broke the symmetry and the the twin that's, that has changed velocity is the one that's going to be uh, younger than the other twin. So with our clocks, it's like we, we have twins that supposedly would age at the same rate or produce at the same time. But uh, to see, in order to see uh, this relativistic effect, time dilation effect, we force one twin to go on a trip. And the way we did that is uh, we apply an electric field to shift uh, the aluminum ion in one of the clock away from the arc null, so it's driven by the elect oscillating electric field into an oscillatory motion. And relativity, relativity tells us that this clock should produce slower time. And this is the result we have seen. We just excite the motion in a really relatively slow far from speed of light uh, velocity, but even for velocities uh, well below 10 meters per second, we can see the effect of the time dilation. And just to put, to put all these velocities into context, if you are swinging on a swing, then you are experiencing a time dilation effect. The clocks can tell. And if you're biking, that's really prominent racing on the freeway, sitting on a bullet train, or flying in an airplane, 
then uh, our clocks will definitely see that you are aging slower. The other relativistic effects uh, we have observed with our clocks is the gravitational redshift. And as uh, Dr. Wong has mentioned, um, the gravitational redshift uh, is, you can understand that by uh, looking at a photon emitted by one aluminum ion climbing up the uh, gravita gravitational potential, and you will lose energy. And because of losing energy, you would experience a redshift. And on the surface of Earth, a centimeter high change corresponds to 1.1 10 to minus 18 frequency shift. And um, we want to see that kind of shift with our clock. Here's a picture of the second, uh, second generation aluminum ion clock. And, and while it's in the original height, we established the frequency difference as zero difference. And then um, we went in the lab, putting a, a hydraulic jack, and slowly jack up the height of the table. And we ex expect the frequency difference to increase because of the height change and the gravitational redshift experience. And at the end, we're putting uh, two pedestals that's uh, 33 centimeter height. And we expect the frequency difference had changed by 3.6 to minus 17. Here's the major result. Uh, as expected, we had established the frequency difference initially before we lifted the table, and after the table is lifted by three, 33 centimeter, we had observed the frequency difference changed by um, 4.1 plus minus 1.6 10 to minus 17, which is uh, as expected. And here's a cartoon showing uh, two colleagues was comparing their clocks, but they don't agree in time because one is actually at a slightly different height. And um, this result uh, got many people excited because um, people are dreaming about using clocks to perform geodesy. And geodesy is a field of study uh, regarding geoid, which is a equipotential surface of gravity potential. To map out the geoid, uh, you can move uh, two high accuracy clocks around, and just by comparing their uh, frequency, you will know whether um, they're on the same equipotential surface or um, how different their potential, potential energy is, dif how, how different their potentials are. But um, you don't see that uh, portable at all. You probably won't imagine moving this thing out of the lab. Moving it up was already pretty uh, tedious. And just imagine moving it into football field, football field or anywhere, anywhere on Earth other than the lab. So uh, one effort we're pursuing is to try to improve the accuracy, improve the reliability, and also decrease the size so it's compact and can fit in the back of a vehicle, a truck. And then we can try to map out the um, uh, gravitational potential of the Earth. Another uh, implication of this is that if we want to compare two optical clocks in different continent or different countries, right now it's uh, still hard to transfer the frequency of the optical clock across a long distance such as like thousands of kilometers. It's still hard to transfer And to compare optical clocks, we can imagine we can move such a clock to another country and compare them side by side. And we don't have the uncertainty of um, the gravitational potential. Okay. To improve the accuracy of the uh, aluminum ion clock, first we need to identify the limitation we are facing in the second generation aluminum ion clock. Um, this is for the experts, so if you don't follow.